Hey guys, Brandy here. So today I'm going to be covering a React Native workshop that Josh and I did in Toronto the other weekend. There will be two parts. First part will be myself going over the basics of React Native and also Redux. And then part two will actually be a live coding portion that will cover an entire application that we will build from start to finish. So stay tuned. Ready? We are about to start the React Native workshop. Please open up a tab and go to this bit.ly link. This will be useful for the second part of the video when we get into phase two, which will be the live coding portion where we build an application together. So here's a quick overview of what we will be covering in this video and also the next video. So today we're going to talk about why React Native and why so many companies are using it and what companies are using it. We'll then go into the basics of React Native, JSX, props, state, and event handling. We will also cover containers, components, styles, and routing. Those things will mainly be in phase two. Then we will have the basics of Redux. We'll go over actions, async actions, reducers, and the store. We are going to cover third-party API integrations with Giphy and also Firebase. So here is the actual agenda. For phase one, we're gonna talk about the value of React Native, the basics of React Native, basics of Redux, and then I'll save time for any questions that you may have. And then in phase two, we're actually gonna be doing the application building. So that'll be project setup, and then we'll go into the routing, views, styles, Redux, and then third-party API integration. So let's take a look at the application that we're going to be building. So this is called Lossless and it's a GIF curation app. And if you understand GIFs and their format, you'll think that's a little clever. So we're gonna click the Getting Started button, which will bring us to a login screen with an input and another button. From there, we are gonna go into the categories where we can pick the different GIF categories. Then we can like and dislike and the ones we like will then be saved to our profile. So first, why React Native? So React Native is a great option to create applications for both iOS and Android. And it gives you that actual native feel and not the web view. So thousands of apps are using React Native from established Fortune 500s to hot new startups. And you can check this out on the React Native Showcase page. See, we have Facebook, of course, and obviously Instagram. There's Airbnb, Walmart, and a ton of other applications that are using this. The list kind of goes on and on. So SoundCloud is an example of an application that uses React Native. And one of their main reasons to use it was because they didn't have enough mobile engineers to build an actual mobile application, so they had to use their web developers. And so it really makes it easy to go from, you know, if you have a web development background into mobile development by using React Native. And Facebook also mentioned that there's about 85% code reuse between iOS and Android implementation. And that's, you know, if you set up the right application structure and you're utilizing all the different components uh, per platform to your benefit. So the next thing we're going to go over is the basics. And the first thing we're going to talk about is the different components. So you see we have a component class and then also a functional component down here. So functional component classes can be pretty simple. The only thing that's required is a render method. Component classes can have internal state and lifecycle methods, so that's very important. The functional components, which is the second example, are even simpler than those component classes. They are primarily used to pre present components. They don't have eternal state or lifecycle hooks. They receive data only through props. Also, React Native has a lot of other built-in components that are already wrapped, like the scroll view and text input. And you'll notice that a lot of components that you're going to want to create, they've most likely been created by the React Native community. So the next thing is the JSX. And this is an 
And this is a syntax for embedding XML within JSS. In JS. In other words, JSX helps structure all your com components that make up a view. Many frameworks use a special templating engine or language which lets you embed code inside markup language. In React and React Native, this is reversed. JSX lets you write your markup language inside your code. This is arguably one of the most controversial things about React. You can use JSX expressions anywhere you could use any other expression. For instance, assigning it to a variable. The next thing is event handling, which is a core piece of any application. Events essentially tell your application when, the, when, when to perform a specific piece of functionality in response to the user. Different React Native components are equipped with different types of action handlers that you can pass a callback function to. These functions will be responsible for carrying out the intended functionality expected by the end user. So example events that we have here, so on press generated by buttons or touchable highlights, or on change text, which is generated by a text input. There's also on long press, which allows you to detect when a user presses and holds on a view for a set amount of time, which is generated by a touchable highlight and a touchable native feedback. The next thing is component lifecycle. Components have a life cycle. They are instantiated, which means created, mounted, which means rendered to the screen, and eventually updated, which means re-rendered, and then unmounted, so then removed from the screen, and destroyed, which is just that, collect garbage collection. The life cycle helps manage the complexity of different platform APIs, iOS or Android, by providing a simple, consistent abstraction layer. The life cycle or life cycle hooks allow you to optionally execute custom code at each step for a more fine grain control. So we have a, a high level component life cycle example. Whenever the co component is rendered to the view in the first time, this is called mounting. So we have component will mount. A component is about to be placed in the view. We then have component did mount. Component has been placed in the view. Whenever a component is removed from the view, that is called unmounting. So component will unmount. As you see here, we're calling component will mount, and then we're calling this action to get likes. What we're saying is we want this to happen before the view is being rendered. Next thing we have is props. Props are best explained as a way of passing data from parent to child. Props are just a communication channel between components, always moving from top, which is the parent, to bottom, the child. This practice of passing data down the component tree from parent to child is commonly called top-down or unidirectional data flow. To pass them to the child, we define a property which looks similar to an attribute on an HTML element. On the child component where the data will be passed through. Once the data is passed to the child component, the child will be able to access the values on props. So you see right here, we're passing in on submit to this login form component. Then we're gonna go into this login form component and see that we are, we are able to utilize that on submit function via props. State is best described as how a component's data looks at any given point, point in time. Components may update their state by passing an object to the method this.setState. Note that you should never directly assign a specific key to the state object, unless inside the constructor, but instead use the method this.setState. Online props, parent elements may not pass um, or access a child's state, as it is intended to manage a child's internal state rather than an external configuration. So in this example of the login form, we're setting the state of the username to an empty string. And then 
Here in the text input, we're going to set that state to whatever the user enters in. Now we are going to go over Redux basics. Redux is a predictable state container for JavaScript apps. It helps you write applications that have been that behave consistently and run in different environments, so client, server, and native, and are easy to test. You can use Redux together with React or any other view library that you would like. So actions. They are just payloads of information that send data from your application to your store. They are the only source of information for your store. You send them to the store using store.dispatch. So an action always has to be sent by a dispatch function. And actions are simply just plain JavaScript objects. They must have a type property that indicates the type of action being performed. So this one has a type of set category. So we know that this action is going to perform the setting of the category. So actions describe the fact that something happened, but don't specify how the application state changes in response. This is a job of the reducers. Reducers listen for a particular action, modify state in response to that action, and return the modified state to the store. The reducer must be pure. So what does that mean? So given some arguments, it should calculate the new state and return it. So no surprises, no side effects, no API calls, no mutations, just a calculation. Inside a reducer, you don't mutate the state object directly. You create a clone of the state object and mutate that. So why is it important to have case statements to specify action types? Well, every action is dispatched to set and sent to every reducer. The only, we only want specific reducers to handle specific actions. The more advanced topic on reducers is reducer composition. This is a practice of breaking out one complex reducer into multiple smaller reducers. This makes the reducers more manageable and readable. So in this GIF reducer, you can see that we're passing in the default state right here. And then we're also passing in that action. And we have a switch statement where we're passing in that action type, which we see right here. And so all we're doing for this one is we are going to return the state. You see we're using that ES25, yeah, 2015 uh, spread operator. And then we're returning the new categories. So in the previous sections, we define the actions that represent the facts about what happened and the reducers that update the state according to those actions. The store is the object that brings them together. It is important to note that you'll only have a single store in a Redux application. So right here you see that we are importing middleware and we're using this thing called thunk and create logger and also our root reducers. Our root reducer is just the reducers that we created. And we'll go over that more when we get into the coding portion of this. We are using Redux Thunk because that's going to handle all of our asynchronous actions. And then our logger is actually what we use to run in our console where we can see the different um, actions taking place. And it's great to use that for debugging. So lastly, we have our async actions. So when you call an asynchronous API, there are two crucial moments in time. The moment you start the call and the moment when you receive the answer or timeout. Usually for any API request, you'll want to dispatch at least three different kinds of actions. An action informing the reducer that the request began, an action informing the reducer that the request finished successfully, an action informing the reducer that the request failed. The standard way to handle asynchronous actions with Redux is to use a Redux, Redux Thunk middleware, which we just discussed in the store. So right here, we have this get gifts, and we are going to dispatch the get gifts request. So we're just sending out that request. Then from there, we are actually calling our API, 
And then we are going to dispatch a success saying, yes, we got the data. Or if it was not successful, then an error would be triggered. So right now we've just covered the basics of React Native and also the basics of Redux. The next step that we are gonna go into is actually the coding portion of our application. So stay tuned and part two will be out shortly.